share. The success of this group depends heavily on participation. Our mission is to provide resources and support to all members of the transgender community, building relationships through fellowship and understanding. There is no fee for your participation. We ask only that you give what you can, and if you cannot give, please come anyway. We have refreshments and information on the side table. I didn't put the information out because I'm a loser and there wasn't enough room. Um, tonight, our speaker is Liz. She will be talking about transitioning later in life and her personal experiences with this. But before we start, let's take a moment to go around and introduce ourselves. If you have a preferred pronoun, be sure to mention them as well. I will start. My name is Brianna. I am a girl, so call me girl son. I am Chris. I have no name, like for the time being, but uh, I pronouns um, her on Facebook. Other than that, Cheers. And Liz, here. <coughs> Oh, Matt, guys. Corinne, uh, she, her. Amy, her preference. Correct. No preference. Sandwich, she, her. Amy, her preference. Thank you. This? Oh, is, is there anyone who has a chat? Uh, yeah. <coughs> Uh -oh. oh, and just so you guys know, we even though we don't get charged for the room, I did make a donation of fifty dollars to the church a couple weeks ago, just to kind of thank them for letting us be here and putting up with us and all of that good stuff. So uh, that's partly what this money paid for, obviously, coffee and things like that. So, so thank you. So again, this um this topic is uh, late transitions. Nice to have with this. For me, this is like pre-transition. Some of you may have seen this already. This has been going around on Facebook and other places. So cartoon. Stop for your tie. Make macaroni. Do cardio. Don't let the existential dread set in. Don't let it set in. Back in the rug. <laughs> did I break the TV? Oh no, I did break the TV. You touched it. I touched it. I shouldn't have touched it. I didn't know it was going to be a touch screen thing. <laughs> Where's exit? It's not a touch screen. Isn't it? How no, it's on it? the, the shiny part of the black stuff. Oh, yes, the shiny part of the black stuff. Hey. Ah, there it is. Hey. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll try not to touch the shiny part of the black stuff I have. <laughs> So again, this is about late transition. Now, I really do think of myself as a late transitioner, even though I started when I was 42. And, um, but there was something I read where somebody referred to somebody as a late transitioner and they were 40. That's late, and probably because I just didn't want to be associated with that term. But there are differences in doing something at age 40, even say at age 18 or 20 or even 30. Um, so some of the topics that I have here are that uh, what is it and why does it happen? Why do we have people who do it very early in life versus people who do it many decades after that? Uh, some of the coping skills that go into surviving that long without transitioning and some of the hiding things that go into it. And also benefits and drawbacks and maybe what we expect for younger generations. So again, like I mentioned, I didn't think of myself as someone who's a late transitioner. I always thought it was someone, of course, someone who's going to be older than me. Until I read that, but I thought, really, it's not like there's a strict definition of what that means. It's just that there are issues that happen more when you're starting up at an older age. Those things are good to know whether you are starting at a younger age to understand what other people are going through, or even if you're somewhere in between, because it's not like any of these issues aren't issues for other people. It's just a matter of degree and where and how they affect us. So it really is kind of on a continuum that we have some of these issues and how much they affect. And of course, a lot of these things you're going to uh, just have different ways that they affect. <clears throat> so why are there different, um, why are there people who do it so much later than, than people who do it at a very young age? Uh, part of it's been society on medical um, shifts. I mean, I grew up since 
Because I already told you how old I was. Growing up in the 70s and 80s, people thought of this a lot differently than they do now. People refer to it in different ways. I mean, generally, the, the impression I had of trans people back then, not really realizing I was one of them, is that, um, is that this was kind of more of a medical oddity than something else. Like, there are these people there that, should, that you should be able to pity. It wasn't something that, that we think of it now as it's just part of the human condition and people who have to do certain things in order to be fulfilled. So, the way that people thought about it, because of the, the different ways that mass communication happened at the time, that we didn't have internet, we didn't have other things, we had just things filtered through standard channels of communication, which is mostly um, network TV. So the ways that people understood what being transgender was, I mean, the, I remember from being a kid, you were described as being trapped in a woman's body or in the wrong body, however you want to say it. And I thought, well, that sounds like it sucks. I'm glad I'm not that way. Because that's not really how I experienced it or felt it. Um, you were the, you took the brunt of a lot of jokes, and we still do. But um, but it was probably worse then, where just someone being transgender was the punchline to jokes, or the concept for TV shows, or things like that. The medical condition back then was a lot different too. That um, and you know that's something that's evolved over time, but definitely from definitely in the 70s and still mostly in the 80s and even through the 90s, where there was a lot more gatekeeping within the medical profession, where they would evaluate you to see if you really qualify, if you really were trans enough to go through um, through transition, if you'd actually get the uh, get the medical side of things. Whereas now, especially if you go to the right providers, they realize that. Nobody is going to do this unless they really need to. Because it's too difficult, too embarrassing, too everything. But this is something that we filter ourselves out. We go there because we need to. Nobody is going to go there unless they really need to. Uh, I mean, it can, it can be fun as you're doing it. Uh, other things that they, they also had these on um, kind of what seemed to me now is the, like odd criteria too. So I know that uh, heteronormativity, if you, if, if um, for a trans woman, if you weren't interested in guys, you obviously weren't actually a trans person. Um, they, they were very much not in gender binary, which wasn't something that people really thought about much until the you last know, decade or so. Uh, they very much looked for early signs in it, even sometimes interviewing uh, family members. And which is, this one's kind of bad because some of us are really good at covering it up. And so now you either have to talk and pretend like you didn't have them, or pretend like you didn't try to cover them up. <clears throat> uh, consistency, that was one of them. I mean, it's still part of the criteria that, that having dysphoric symptoms for some period of time in order to demonstrate that it's not just something that popped up is what the requirements now, but they just take your word for it. There there was there was more there was more requirement around there. And if you had doubts in the past that could be something that, that may raise a red flag for them. And then even the uh, requirements for just even going on hormones were for some doctors used to be that you had to present full time for a year before you go on hormones. Now that's nuts to me, because being on hormones is what allows people to be full-time for a year, not the other way around. For a lot of people, that, that's, that's the, that makes the difference between being able to actually live that way for you without being harassed out of whatever situation you're in. So that now seems completely backwards from what it should be. And there are also other um, concepts back there at the time, too, that really tried to filter out people who were actually trans from people who were just, I guess, doing it for, for fun. Like if they just had um, sexual, like, sexual fantasies of being a woman. Thought that that was something that was, um, that was something that there was a possibility for people who were going in for treatment, and they would try to filter that out. <clears throat> So all these things are things that um, could prevent somebody from having gone through that. And 
I never actually tried to get to the medical part until fairly recently. So this isn't something that kept me out, but it could have. The, um, the ideas, the ones that really kept me from doing it earlier, were those ideas of what it really was to be trans. So being trapped in one's body. Again, that's not really quite how I felt it. And so that was something that just made me think that, well, no, I've, I've something like that. I mean, maybe I'm trans I don't know. But it's definitely not, definitely not something to the extent that I would be qualified to go through any type of medical stuff to, to change myself. Can you repeat what you said about uh, the last part there? I'm sorry. With the, this one? Yeah. That organophilia? Yeah. That was a theory that's been, that was put out in, I think, uh, I don't remember if it was the early 90s, that um, there's a psychologist who came up with the idea. And what it was really is that uh, they separated, they thought there were people who were cross-dressers versus people who were uh, actual trans people. Cross-dressers will stay cross-dressing, but the ones who really want to take it to the next level will then want to go through um, to go through the medical transition part of it, just so they can look even more female for their for their unholy thoughts or whatever it was that they they, they thought of that as. And something else that, that um, goes along with that, I remember when when I first started looking into some of the stuff, and and this this I can tell now that it was written some time ago, but I, I looked on the internet for things about I don't remember what I was searching for. I came across this article that was called. So you want to be a tea girl, which right away now thinks like that's something you shouldn't read. And it was it was something that was very very long. And but a couple things that really resonated with me is that said people, uh, especially when you hit your forties, your testosterone levels start to go down. If you have some of these tendencies already, all of a sudden they're going to spring out because of that, and you're going to say, I need to do this. And then, but the rest of what was saying, like how those people are not really actually transgender, and how terrible their lives were going to be from then on out, how you're going to be forced into prostitution, and it was, it really was, did not paint a pleasant picture. But again, I mean, now looking at it, it did kind of scare me. In fact, you look like, yeah. have you read it? No, but just, I want my, my past yeah, really yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so did you did you throw all the So what did she attribute it to? Um, well, like crisis and um, really didn't know. Um, Thank you. 
Did you follow the advice? Okay. No. <clears throat> and I, I think that, I don't think that what she was saying was really all that uncommon for psychologists from a previous era. And if you're not in the realm of, if you haven't had additional training around um, around gender type issues, you might still just have what you had left over from the 90s and before, and fall back on that because probably I'm not sure where people, where psychologists would get that kind of information up to. If they're not going to seminars on those specific things, we probably have continuing kind of type things where they have to do. But there's so many things that you could study that that's probably not the one that was um, probably not the ones that she took the continuing education things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, there is a crossover between between gender and sexuality in that it is, for me, it was always difficult to try to be in any type of sexual situation realizing that I was in the wrong gender. So sometimes that in order to do anything, I'd have to try to imagine myself in in some other way. And so then at the same point, that hearing some of the things that I knew from the past of what people would say about us, reading that stupid article that I had read, which had a few things that, that hit a little too close to home, some of those did put a seed of doubt into my head, thinking, what if this is something that isn't really what I am, but it's just something that I want? And uh, what if there is, now, I, obviously this didn't keep me from doing it, but I thought, what if there is, what they're saying is actually true? I didn't think it was because I don't know if it was anyway. And it's probably more than what I hear, but, but part of the medical part of it is taking, uh, for me, it was taking spiral, which is the testosterone blocker. And part of that is I went through about an eight month period in which I was effectively medically asexual. I had no interest in any sexual anything. And I was just as interested in continuing process as I was before, or even more so, which removed any doubt in my head that that had any part to do with it. It was this was something that really was innate. That any crossover with any kind of sexuality was there because that makes sense, not because the sexuality part of it is driving in any way. from all that, I had no idea I was trans. Up until, you know, relatively recently. Just because, again, I, I thought I had enough excuses, I had enough reasons to think that I was something else. In part based off of what people had thought in the past, because I hadn't kept up enough with that. And in part because I probably didn't want to know. <coughs> but there are other things that could go into it. I mean, I'm just making that this here. And I should have probably said this earlier on, that a lot of the stuff I'm presenting here, a lot of this is just speculation on my part. A lot of it is going to be based off of what I've noticed myself, what I've gotten from talking to people, but those are just samples. It's not like this is something that I've come up with academically or done studies on. It's just, just some guesses. Which is why there's a lot of question marks in here. Because I don't know what I'm thinking anyone really knows. Because one thing that's all, that has somewhat interested in me over time is, is the kids who at a very early age, like seven, four, whatever age it is, they come on and tell their parents, I'm so this, this isn't this isn't me, I'm not supposed to be this way. And I think, like, how do you know this so early? I mean, I, when I look back, I saw signs. I saw, and now they're, in, in retrospect, they're pretty obvious signs, but it wasn't jumping out of me like, you didn't want gender. It was just other things, they're were, they were more social type clues. So maybe that could be it. So the, I, I wonder if one of the reasons that um, that there are some people who are able to come out earlier versus the ones who do later could be how they get the symptoms. Do they sense different symptoms? Because a lot of times, sometimes the narratives uh, that um, you hear from people are based around the physical parts of you, the um, the anatomical part of it, and that part really didn't bother me as much as it does for some people, especially when I was a social when I was fairly young. It was more just like the not feeling like I could fit in, the feeling like I wasn't really supposed to be with boys. Um, 
um, so I don't know if that has any part of it either, because I think the social ones are a little harder to figure out. If you're talking about something there that's not supposed to be there, that's a little more obvious from a younger age. Um, another thing that could have an influence, and again, really just best, is their coping skills. And these are kind of important because in order to go this many decades without doing something about it, it means that you've got some pretty good coping skills to handle them. And I mean, really, looking back, I don't know how the hell I did it. I wouldn't be able to do it now. If what it would take for me to detransition, I, I don't think I could do it. And if I somehow ended up in that position, somehow it would be terrible. I, I don't think I could handle it, really. But I think it's going to be able to handle it for three or four decades before that. So how I did that, I'm not really quite sure. You know, there are different, yeah, of course there are different types of coping skills, like uh, some people do it through. They're trying to go against it completely, trying to show that they aren't by saying that maybe they um, trying to be as macho as they can, or, or you know, trying to do as much as they can prove that they are not actually the or vice versa for their life. I, mine was actually to try to accommodate as much as I could. So I really tried to, because I, from a really early age, I understood that there was something inside me, I just didn't know how to describe it, or what it was. But I knew it was never going away, I never really tried to fight it, because I could tell, even from the very young that I wasn't going to be able to really fight it in the way. So that, well, I just have to try to make room for it. Now, at the same time, I also knew it was about the least socially acceptable thing in the world, so I couldn't, I couldn't accommodate it too much, but at least enough to get me by. And over time, the amount that was, it got bigger and bigger as people cared less and I cared less. And of course, we already talked about the societal and medical shifts. So, are coping skills that help us get through that? Are they good or are they bad? I mean, I always kind of wonder that. If I didn't have good social, if I didn't have good coping skills that made me relatively happy during the time before I transitioned, would I have been better off? Well, I would have been miserable. So that way it would be bad. But at the same time, if I had been miserable, maybe I would have done something about this earlier. Would that have been bad or good? Well, that would have been good. But I've been really miserable up until that time. So then I bump into the, um, the whole medical thing. Uh, there is um, a book that's called um, Two Cells, a book that was published, I think, in 1989. That was one of the first type of books that had a lot of narratives of trans people and what they're like and how they are. And that's one of the early books that I read. And that's the end of it. I saw that it was in 89, which is when I graduated from high school. I saw that it was written by, after I was done, I saw that it was written by a psychologist who had a clinic in Los Gatos, California, which is where I grew up. There's a clinic that was probably a mi two miles from my house that was, that was the one that was the basis for this seminal book on trans people. But at the same time realizing that I don't know if they would have let me in because of those because of those things. I don't know how much I don't know how closely they adhered to the criteria that they had. So again, my way to um, to uh, go through uh, to survive this was to accommodate. So for me, and again, now this is just kind of back to me. The way that I accommodated things is that. Because I could always sense that there was something that was there, somewhere along that spectrum. Again, I thought like when I was really when I was getting close to adolescence and I'd heard what gay was and what people described it, but oh crap, I'm gay. And then I thought, ah, oh, this sucks. And just because society didn't like gay people. I mean that was pretty clear, at least in the playgrounds. And when I did have adolescence and I kept thinking that until I realized, like, wait a minute, I'm attracted to girls. The gay doesn't make sense anymore. Okay, well, that's good, but then what the hell am I? That's bad. So I still somehow knew I was something, something in there, it was just something I seemed undefined. So I, I always felt like I was, I was in parallel with people, I just didn't know where I was. And so I always felt like I was tried to be a proponent for gay people. Um, and as I got older, once I say, like, yeah, sometime in high school and then afterwards, that 
a lot of the things that once they started covering less, then more of the more of the uh, more of me started coming out, and people started to get the idea that what type of people do they think I was gay because they see some of the some of my mannerisms and they assume it's what it was. That's kind of blow on the lines. Oh, that's you're getting you're getting there. I don't know what else to call. So like, sure, think I'm gay. That's fine. And and actually, that was it was something that was kind of nice to know to have people realize that I was something. Even though I know that wasn't exactly where it was, it was it was somewhere along here. And because of that, um, I really didn't have to. It made it a little bit easier because I didn't have to now try to do as much covering. So I didn't have to do what people expected guys to do, like you know, sports and that kind of crap. Because I could just that's just a huge part of me is to make fun of people who like sports and know stuff about them. And also, one thing that was um, somewhat of a it was a double show, but by and large I liked is that my last name was Lily. So lots and lots of jokes around that. Having a female first name as your last name. And now a lot of jokes actually just centered around the word Lily, which I've really had lots of very people on there. Um, so that's people get confused and they think that my name is Lily, especially if it were something like an email or um, just written somewhere that like haven't met me. So that was always kind of fun. And of course, occasionally dressing up the clothes. But this was, um, I took a picture of this before, before this got uh, hauled out. Actually, I mean, so some of these. These are some of my shirts from, from my, from my being, pretending to be a boy days. Lots of floral stuff and pink and purple. So yeah, that was, that was my accommodation. And again, this kind of goes back to the, does Kofi help or does it hurt? And it's probably the same about. And maybe that goes back into, do people transition earlier or late? Are they able to handle it? The pressures of trying to be someone you're not? If you can, well, then you can come back. But then again, to what you know. Now, the flip side of accommodation is also hiding. Because if you have to keep an or if you're not accommodating at all, that means you're still hiding things. So, even, even me, who I thought, like, well, I'm, I'm the one, I'm the type who is actually, uh, since I'm showing so much of it, I'm, yeah, I'm ahead of the curve. I'm already, I, I'm already partially out, is what I tell myself. So I'm, I've got that part of it partly kind of, but really there's so much of it that's, that's very deep, deeply ingrained, especially because the good things in hide come from, from a very early age, because especially other kids, I was able to sense some of the stuff better than adults on. So, I mean, I got harassed for the stuff that I was in first grade. And then, so you, that's when you start to learn what not to do, what things to try to cover up. And I was just a, like a, a little physical thing, or the, how you would say things, or what you would talk about. So you start to filter it. You start to watch what you say, you start to watch how you walk. You start to do things to make sure that you don't slip up. And doing that from an early age through the end of high school, it becomes a little bit of a habit. So even when you start to let some of it out, there's still a lot of left. A lot of filtering that's there. And so you put enough filters like that on, but when you're doing both physical and communication things, that you start to insulate yourself through these filters that you put on. And that at least for me, it led to a feeling of emptiness. Um, it's also something that um, that is hard to unwrap. Something that I'm still trying to figure out. How many of the things that I did before are because I was just trying to cover interest? How much of how much of what I'm doing now is left over values from that? And, you know, it affects everyone. It affects your friends, your family, because they see these filters. And if, if you're feeling kind of empty because of it, if you're feeling guarded all the time because of it, well, it affects them. It affects your relationships. I go back and think of all the relationships, all of the old relationships I've had at the time. How many of them were because of this? All of them? Maybe? I actually don't want to know. Because I just don't want to know. Then, you find yourself in the current relationships that you have. 
the ones that have gone through all that. And now, you want to change it, you want to get rid of them. But these are now the people who have stuck with you through the filters. They may not want you to remove the filters, because now you're showing what you really are, and they may like the filters more than they like you. Now, most of them are actually going to like the real you better than they like the filters, but they don't know that right away. They don't like the change. And that brings us back to existential dread. Especially the filtering part. I mean, this really, for me, the living, the living with the filter is the living with the washing yourself. This really, this really is a little too, a little too close to home. But, back to the, the nuts and bolts of doing this stuff. I mean, there's obviously going to be benefits and drawbacks to transitioning to everything. Well, and, yeah, well, because again, this is a lot of transition late and late transitioners that, um, that that's that's where this perspective is. And some of the, the drawbacks to transition later in life are that your know, relatives are older. So my parents are in their seventies, and people in seventies may not, on average, be quite as accepting of this as parents in their forties and fifties or thirties. So that's one of the drawbacks. I mentioned the family relationships before. That's something too, that, that the longer you do this, the more the more carnage there is left behind you. Because you've got uh, kind of two decades worth of that carnage kind of left behind from it. The people that you know now are probably long established family friends. And again, I'm not going to be as interested in transition as you are. If you're younger, you've got less, less um, long-standing relationships with people because you've known them for less time because you can't know them for as long. If you are uh, older, you may have a you may have a job or a career that is not as interested in transitioning as if you were younger, or didn't, or you weren't established in your work yet, or if you weren't even working, like if you're still a student. That makes it a little bit easier to transition to work because now you're not transitioning at work. So you don't have the risk of having gone through a lot of work to build yourself up to a certain point within the work field and then having to start over or find yourself in a point because of that. <coughs> There's also a lot of what ifs that come through that. I think all the time about like, what if I done when I was eight? What if I done when I was 13? What if I done 18? What if I done when I was 30? What? How much of the kind of that we're going to talk about would be not there? How much, um, what would I have done differently? Like 20 years of being the, you know, if I think of starting being in 20, that would have been 21 years of being in the That would have been huge. And, but again, I may have been realistic. But it's still hard not to think about what things could have been if you had taken care of, taken care of this a little earlier. Also, then there's also the, the physical and medi medical complications. And even, even just being 40, my doctor said, well, now you're at high risk for estrogen, so you have to use patches instead, and you have to do more things to just make sure that you're not going to have blood clots and such. And there's also the part that, that the later you start, the less overall results you might see. So people who start in their 20s tend to get more results on the hormones of people starting in the 40s. We get more results in the 60s. So there are benefits to medical benefits to starting earlier, both safety and the results. But there's also, um, it's also benefits to being later. So, yeah, you're a snap. So, in some ways, you're your own person, more so than you were when you were much younger. But you've got a little bit more self determination. If you're if you're still in school, you're going to be much more dependent on your parents. My parents didn't approve of this. Who cares? I did it anyway. If I'd been in high school, well then that would have made that would have made things a lot more difficult because they're the ones who are paying for things, they're the ones who do tracks and they're the ones who get to say what you do and if you're grounded or not. So that also goes into the confidence and the ability part too which is, 
I felt much more of someone who knew what I was doing at age 22 than I would have been at age 20. 30, probably not much difference than 40, but, but you do have a different perspective on yourself. You understand yourself better, you know what you can do, and you know how to handle certain things that you wouldn't otherwise. There's also, um, I think you've got also a sense of realism. Uh, you, I think if I'd done this at a very early age and I had high expectations, unrealistic expectations of what the results of doing all this would be, now I think I was probably pretty realistic. Also, I could afford it. That was an expensive. Because there, there are a lot of costs that are associated with it. And the last thing on here. I think, I don't remember exactly what I was trying to get out with that, but, um, but one thing that I did think about, um, about this when I first started it, I thought, God, this would have done so much easier, so much better, I thought that was much fun. But, I thought going through the whole thing was a lot of fun. But, if I had done it when I was in 20, that experience would have been 20 years ago, and I would lose the benefit of being able to do it now. Because it really was fun. I mean, I think if, if I had done it, uh, 20 years ago, it would have seemed like that was ancient history, and I'm just living my life. And now, even now, just even a year and something in, it's almost starting to feel like, well, this is just normal life. It's like not a transition, just things are just normal. And so I don't, I don't really have the euphoria that came from being able to fix things. And if I'd done that earlier, that would definitely be something that was long in the past. But again, you know, I'm talking about this like as if, as if people would really decide, am I going to do it now that I'm 18 or should I wait till I'm 40? I mean, nobody's, nobody's thinking that. And you really, the only reason I did it when I was 40 is because that's when I realized I should and could do it. I think that's the only time that people do do it. So it's not like people are trying to decide, it's just a matter of how you get there. So really the best time to do it is when you decide that you have to do it and you can't. Which is really what people do that anyway. So I'm not going to try to convince people to wait or to try to convince them to do it earlier. Because people are by and large going to do it at their first available opportunity. And so the last thing I have in here is that again, there's uh, a lot of the things are guesses based off of based off of whether the things were societal or whether they were based off of uh, symptoms. But society is doing quite a bit. So for people who are growing up now, is there going to be much of a difference? It could be that we and we find that people just in general start starting to transition and you know really doing a lot of people living along the age spectrum. Just because people can find out information about this at an earlier age which would have helped me quite a bit in, in figuring this out. And because it's just more acceptable. And we also have different changes in, in how the medical community treats this too. So it would be much easier to, for me to have figured out what I need to do. And then to do it. If I, had, if I were 18 now, than being 18 and 19 and 19. So, there is a chance that this is going to be kind of a new subject in 20 years from now. And if it's a mood subject, that would be great because then, again, there, there really are more benefits to starting earlier than there are to starting later. And so I hope that we move in that direction and hope that we do fine so that um, people can come out and realize you realize that what they are, and you just can't come out in the area. And that's all I have.